Welcome to the Robotics Through Science Fiction Podcast. I'm Robin Murphy, and in this podcast I'll try to answer the question, are some people better than others at controlling robots? The question is the heart of the Dominic Green short story, Shining Armor. Shining Armor is a fun little story about a near future in a town in a sort of third-worldish country. The town's special because it has a guardian robot, a giant piloted mecha similar to a Jaeger from Pacific Rim. The robot's been parked for decades, but now corporate bad guys want to acquire the local land and displace the townies, either by buying them out or by good old-fashioned violence. Cue the robot! The twist of the story is that access is linked to genetics. You have to be in the right family to control a particular robot because controlling the robot requires special skills. We discovered this along with a young boy who's tagging along with his grandfather. Is it so far-fetched that our genes might determine if we can operate sophisticated robots? The answer now is yes, That's far-fetched, and by applying good human-robot interaction principles, any reasonably qualified person who's trained should be able to handle a robot. But the answer in the 1970s through the late 1990s, before the field of human-robot interaction was established in 2001, was, no, some people may be just better than others, and we should find those people and create a robot academy to refine their skills. Here's what was happening in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Roboticists were toiling away, making advances in hardware and software. New actuator here, new software behavior there. Each of these advances, and this is still true today, requires very sophisticated knowledge in that particular field of hardware or software. But robots are complex systems. And so many robot products represent a couple of great advances, but with the rest of the system hacked together. So the robot system would wind up being overly complicated and jury-rigged, all about highlighting the new advances, not really designed like a system or a product. To make matters worse, robotics is made, and we continue to make, the assumption that a user interface is something you tack on at the end of the design process. A great example of this is the DARPA Robotics Challenge. You can read the analysis I performed for DARPA here. You had robot, you had humanoid robots requiring teams of 28 engineers with a couple of operators trained just to get the robot through one of the tasks. And then they'd swap out with new operators trained to get the robot through the next task. If you build robots like that, you in fact do need a PhD in robots, plus a high aptitude for 3D visualization and spatial reasoning to keep up with what the robot's doing and what it could do at any moment. Essentially, we thought robot operators needed to be Ender Wiggins, or barring that, a group of innately talented and highly trained people like astronauts, or that we robot start over, or that we roboticists, since we were the only ones who could run the robots we built, were actually versions of Ender and astronauts. Maybe not as physically adept, but very special and heroic and elite. The world just needed more of us. To quote Dr. Evil, yeah, right. In 2001, robotics caught up to the rest of the engineering profession and acknowledged that robotics really required two things it had heretofore been lacking. Systems engineering. In effect, design the system, not design a cool part, and then tack on the other components and call it a system, and decent user interfaces. User interface research, part of the very large field of human computer interfaces, think Apple, had already helped overcome problems with complexity, displaying too much information, poor representation of 3D layouts, and so on, and doing this for airplanes, nuclear power plants, chemical plants, and MP3 players. It wasn't clear that roboticists had taken those courses or looked at the textbooks, but we couldn't put it off any longer. But to be fair, robotics need more than HCI. The challenge is that robots require more than a typical user interface on a desktop or a laptop. Your laptop is not a physically situated agent that directly moves and manipulates the environment. And we're not talking about ordering things from Amazon. 
Plus, a robot's generally providing less information, less perceptual information to the operator than a high-end first-person shooter video game would provide. Yet the stakes are much more real. As a result, working through a robot increases cognitive workload and fatigue. Now, these are all problems for an operator working behind the robot. Now, what about someone in front of the robot or working side by side? Say, a person trying to follow a robot tour guide or a victim being found by a rescue robot. That's a very different set of interactions than a user interface, and it touches on social interactions. Social interactions include things like how people react negatively to shiny, black, badass looking robots, no matter how cool the roboticists think they look. You want people to play nice with a robot? You need the robot to look cuddly and non-threatening. The RoboCop look is great for a police robot, not so good for a healthcare robot for grandma. But I digress. The point is, in 2001, we all began to realize it was time for robotics to catch up with human-computer interaction, but that robotics was significantly different than HCI. And thus, the field of human-robot interaction was created at a workshop sponsored by DARPA and the National Science Foundation. I was a co-organizer, and that workshop remains one of the pinnacles of my career. So by 2010, the Robot Academy idea had faded away. User interfaces haven't necessarily improved as roboticists. We still put that last on the to-do list instead of embedding it in the design process. But we all know that with good human-robot interaction design, even though we might believe it's still someone else's problem to do, a mundane person should be able to use or engage with a robot. And that mundane someone might be a mischievous grandfather. Or not. You need to read the story to find out. You can find Shining Armor in the We Robots Anthology, edited by Alan Castor. It's a quick, fun read. And remember, if you want to learn more about robotics and artificial intelligence, check out my new book, Robotics Through Science Fiction, Artificial Intelligence Explained Through Six Classic Robot Short Stories. And subscribe to our YouTube channel and our newsletter so you won't miss a thing.